Well, good evening. I'm thinking that we should probably go ahead and get started. I expect this to actually really be a, a, a vigorous conversation that we want to get, make sure that we've left as much time as possible to answer questions. I'm Alexis Thompson. I'm the uh, 2018 ASH president. I want to thank you all for attending this uh, ASH Research Collaborative Sickle Cell Disease Clinical Trial Network session. Um, for those who have, are not accustomed to seeing either this logo or this nomenclature, the, the ASH Research Collaborative was established this year. Um, it's intended to foster collaborative partnerships to accelerate progress in hematology with the goal of improving the lives of people with uh, blood disorders. You're going to be hearing a lot more about what the current components of this, but this is absolutely a work in progress. The foundation of the ASH Research Collaborative is, is, is its data hub, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. This is a technology platform that facilitates exchange of information by aggregating data in one place and making it available for inquiry research grade data with research grade data on heme disorders. The ASH Research Collaborative Sickle Cell Disease Clinical Research Network is the second component that's going, going online of the ASH Research Collaborative. It will be launched in 2019. I would argue that it's already launched in 2018. Um, but it's, it's certainly set to optimize the conduct of clinical trials, uh, research in sickle cell disease. The network intends to leverage the data hub to collect key information and identify gaps that will advance sickle cell disease research and treatment. I'd like to introduce you to our presenters who will provide you with an introduction to both of these initiatives, which we're really very excited about. Um, I'd like to introduce the co-chairs of the ASH Research Collaborative Sickle Cell Disease Clinical Trial Network, Dr. Charles Abrams from the University of Pennsylvania, and also Dr. Ed Benz from the Dana-Farber Institute. I also want to introduce Dr. Chuck Chesson, who is a relative, relative newcomer to the, uh, the ASH family. Uh, he is the director of the Clinical Trials Network. Uh, and Dr. William Wood from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who is the chair of our uh, registry oversight group, which I'm sure his name will be changing since uh, so many other things are moving so fast. Um, at any rate, welcome. Uh, now I'd like to turn um, the mic over to Dr. Abrams, who will provide a bit of background on the network. Thanks, Alexis. So uh, I actually can feel the energy and the commitment in this room. So uh, I'm really glad to see this day has come. Uh, so in 2016, uh, when I was uh, president of ASH, we held a summit on sickle cell. And the idea of it at that time was we recognized there was a problem. We recognized there was a problem that wasn't being addressed. And we got a group of people together. And so this included uh, um, uh, physicians, nurses, patients, investigators, drug companies, uh, people from government, and we all uh, brainstormed about what can we do to make a difference in this disease. And from a research perspective, the overwhelming consensus was that we need some sort of clinical trials network. And so that's when the idea was conceived. And the, the idea is that if we can make a network of sites that would truly engage patients and have a better characterization of where the patients were and what their diseases uh, were like, that we would be able to partner with people who want to do clinical trials. We'd be able to rapidly enroll patients into trials. We'd be able to complete uh, clinical trials. And the overarching goal was to have FDA-approved drugs that would improve the lives of sickle cell patients. And so that's the whole idea, and it's, I think that's why we're all here. So a task force was uh, formed. Uh, um, Banu Egan, uh, Vivian Sheehan, uh, uh, Marty Steinberg, uh, Sophie uh, um, Loskren, uh, Jane Winner, and John Bird, as well as Ed and I, uh, um, uh, got involved. And we started... Uh, um, putting together a strategy for this. And so in 2017, we had a workshop on a clinical trials network, and we invited people 
who had formed clinical trials networks in other diseases because we wanted to learn uh, the recipe uh, um, and we wanted to be sure that we weren't going to repeat mistakes that other groups had, uh, had done in the past. So this past May, a plan was taken forward to the ASH Executive Committee. It was approved, and now we're here today. And so I think that it's actually terrific. I think we're going to make a difference in this disease, and I think it's a time that we just galvanize our forces here, and we all work together. And so I want to thank you all for your interest in this. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, when we first thought about this, we thought maybe we would get 40 or 50 people, and we talked ourselves into about 75, and so I'm very, very pleased with the turnout tonight. So I spent the last 25 years of my life in HIV research before I came here four months ago. And when I started in HIV research, there were three drugs available, and 25 years later, there were 45 drugs available. And it reminds me of sickle cell disease right now. There were two drugs available. And uh, the goal for me is to get to that 45 number as fast as we can or get the cure. And so why did that happen? I, I, and I've thought about this a lot. It was, it was uh, the community spoke out, um, clinicians, researchers, and all came together. And they formed networks. And they, these networks allowed the studies to go uh, much more efficiently and much faster, and we're able to get the drug approval, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. So uh, the foundation of the network is the patients. Uh, that's why we're actually all here, is to find better treatments for them. We have the sites and the clinicians and the researchers, and then we have uh, the data and the technology uh, with our data hub that's going to allow us to answer lots of questions. Um, so that's really the foundation and what we're going to be talking about tonight. So where are we with this? So I'm happy to say that we are just now finishing uh, phase one, which is staffing and infrastructure. So we are uh, fully staffed for phase one. We have our governance set up, and uh, that's ready to go. We're now moving into site selection and onboarding. Um, and then sometime in the spring, we will start actually working on phase three while we're still in phase two, so that we have some studies ready to go when the network's ready to go. So the Site selection steps are the letter of intent was released on November 15th, and we're having the Q&A tonight. Uh, the applications are going to be due at the end of January. And then uh, we have a site selection committee that are going to be reviewing the applications and looking at the qualified applicants, and then there will be an invited um, response to an RFP, which will be a longer version of what the LOI is. And then sometime in the late spring, early summer, we'll be announcing the sites. So as we were thinking about how to model the network and set it up, there were a couple of things we needed to consider. Um, one, what was the best way to engage the sickle cell disease community at the local levels? And uh, for patients that don't have access to major academic medical centers, how can we reach them so that they can participate in the research also? So uh, we've borrowed this from the HIV and uh, cancer communities. It's a hub and spoke model. So we're going to, we're calling this the clinical trials unit. And so uh, this is the applicant organization. This is where the PI for the unit is. And there will be a clinical research coordinator that will be provided uh, funding through uh, ASH Research Collaborative. Uh, and then we're going to form community advisory boards so that we're not uh, aligning ourselves with any one uh, sickle cell disease NGO or CBO. Um, so we're going to form, form local community advisory boards. It will be the PI at the site who will figure out what's, what's the best way to engage their community. Uh, there's uh, four different groups we would like to be, see represented in this community advisory board, and that are uh, parents who have children with sickle cell, uh, adolescents, uh, young adults who are transitioning into adult care, and then adults. Um, and then two representatives from every local community advisory board will represent uh, that community advisory board at a national community advisory board, and they will be coming to a national meeting um, 
once a year. And so the community advisory board will also be looking to when they get a, a protocol at the local site, that community advisory board at that site will also be reviewing the protocol to be sure it's appropriate for that community. Uh, not every protocol will probably be appropriate for each community. So uh, we really want to empower the patients and those with si living with sickle cell and affected with sickle cell in their lives to, to have a say so in what research is going on. And then each um, unit will have additional sites. So we think these sites will maybe um, several hundred miles away. They may be a whole city coming together to form sites. It could be a whole state. I've heard of a couple of states pulling together to form a consortium. Um, and so but it's really up to the PI at the clinical trials unit to best decide how to serve their region and their uh, community. And I, I, if I remember right, we said you had to have at least one CRS, but we did not put a maximum on it. So the data hub is really the foundation of the clinical trials network. So everyone participating will be uh, sharing their data with us in the data hub. And it allows us to do um, several key things for the clinical trials network besides being a great resource to ask research questions to. Uh, we're going to be able to characterize active patient populations. So when uh, we go to do a trial, we'll be able to look and see how many patients have actually been seen in the last six months. Um, we'll be able to identify the sites for specific protocols. So the protocol's already written. We will be able to look at the inclusion exclusion criteria and pick the sites that have the most appropriate patient populations to do those studies. Uh, we would like for uh, sponsors to actually talk to us before they finalize the protocol and look at their inclusion and exclusion criteria so we can help guide them about opening the right level of inclusion and exclusion so that we can um, enroll the trials effectively and without excluding too many people from participation. So as we've said several times, patient engagement is the key, one of the key components. Um, so um, we have a saying that we're gonna build it with you and not for you, so that we're gonna have patient uh, engagement as a key cornerstone of everything we do in this network. So we um, have uh, issued an RFP a couple of months ago. We've been reviewing uh, applications and we'll be making a vendor selection uh, probably in the month of December. And so one of the first things that are going to happen is we have selected eight cities to start a tour and we're going to go to Los Angeles, Oakland, um, Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Orlando, and Houston. And those are going to be half day to six hour workshops. Uh, we will be uh, recruiting and be ensured that we again have those four key target audiences available for those days uh, for breakout sessions, uh, which are again, uh, parents of children with sickle cell disease. And uh, I would like to have a good range of the, I think there's a difference between people who have infants and people who have maybe six and seven year olds. Uh, so we get good representation. Uh, again, adolescents, uh, those young adults who are transitioning into adult care. And again, uh, I think adults, when we say adults, I think we would like to hear from different age groups in the adults too. We've talked about that just, um, so we're getting those who are living longer with sickle cell disease to have a voice in what's going on at their sites also. Um, and then there's gonna be two um, deliverables that we really are looking forward to from this uh, when we're going to be documenting the, the barriers to care, and I think we all know what the barriers are, uh, but we'll be documenting that. But we're also going to be looking at what the systematic uh, solutions to that are, so that when the pharmaceutical and sponsors come to us, we're going to say, you've got to provide transportation, you have to have child care. These are the things we're going to demand you do uh, in order to, to uh, go to the sites. And so we're looking forward to documenting that and documenting what are good solutions. And the second deliverable is something I'm really, really really excited about. Um, we've looked through literature and can't find that this has ever been done before, so we're going to be developing a patient-centered uh, research priorities from those meetings, uh, So, and we're going to make that into a living document that we'll be sharing and uh, putting pressure, um, encouraging sponsors to, <laughs> to fund those research priorities, uh, so a little slip of the tongue, sorry. <laughs> So, in all seriousness, I think in the HIV community, this was so successful, so successful, listening to what the patient's research priorities are. It's not just all about 
a cure. I think there are a lot of comorbidities, there's pain problems, there's uh, mental health issues that they would like assistance with. So I think there's a lot of things we're going to hear from the community about what their priorities are and so that be sure that we're actually funding those. And so we're going to kind of do a report card every 12 to 18 months about where we are and how well we're doing with addressing uh, their research priorities as well as uh, the sponsor's priorities. Uh, we're going to be developing uh, resource, um, resources uh, for the patients, uh, like how do I make a decision about what kind of clinical trial I should participate in. And so uh, we're excited about that also. And we have um, shot several hours of videos with uh, sickle cell disease patients who have participated in clinical trials. We did some panels and individual interviews, and we're going to be turning that into a series of five-minute uh, videos that we're going to be sharing with the community at large. Uh, several people that we've been talking to, um, uh, people around the country about the workshops, they all asked for a video. They said it would really help us recruit for these if we have some videos to help get the patients understand what's going on. So uh, those will be coming out very quickly. Um, so to recap, uh, there's two main things going on right now, patient engagement. Uh, we will be um, engaging in workshops early in the uh, spring of next year. Um, we will be having the patient center research agenda will be coming out next winter. And then uh, we have site onboarding going on and um, sometime in the late spring or early summer we'll be announcing the sites. And then I'm calling it, we'll have a network ready to actually do the first trial um, in the winter of 2019. So we're about a year away. And that's it, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Wood. Thanks very much. Um, pleased to uh, say a few words tonight um, about the ASH Research Collaborative Data Hub. Um, as the current chair of the ASH Research Collaborative Data Hub Oversight Group, joined tonight by um, several individuals um, with ASH who have been working tirelessly to uh, make this vision a reality, um, as well as our um, trusted technology partner as well. So a couple, uh, couple key points just to raise before turning back to the um, clinical trials network. Um, and that is around the term data hub. Some of those in the room may have heard something about the ASH registry over the past year. This was a term that we were using. We've now migrated to a term of data hub to more accurately reflect the flexibility that we've envisioned for what we anticipate as a rich data repository for a variety of benign and malignant hematologic conditions. You may be uh, aware that we have started in multiple myeloma and sickle cell disease um, under the leadership of uh, Ken Anderson from myeloma and importantly Alexis Thompson here um, for sickle cell disease. And as articulated um, by uh, Dr. Thompson and her colleagues in the Sickle Cell Disease Project, um, the initial vision of the Sickle Cell Disease Project in the Data Hub is as follows. Information on the natural history of sickle cell disease from a robust, large-scale, contemporary data repository is an essential component for successful research efforts. By aggregating data, the Data Hub should provide a more accurate, up-to-date picture of the sickle cell disease patient population. And we believe that the formation of this data hub in and of itself would provide a valuable um, resource for the community, um, but pairing it with the clinical trials network, I think, um, provides uh, a combination that will ac accelerate both. The data hub is envisioned as being a resource that can acquire a wide variety of data from many different sources, um, shown here on the left, for a rich variety of uses. Um, here, to bring clarity to what we're talking about, we're really discussing primarily in this context um, data from clinical systems and laboratory systems um, at the site level from those sites um, who plan to participate in the clinical trials network. And the use here is to help inform this clinical trials network um, or in other contexts, research consortia. Over time, the Data Hub can continue to build and expand and acquire other sources of data and make those data available for other uses. Um, but here again, we're talking about this initial use case in the context of the CTN. 
So how does an ASH Research Collaborative Data Hub work? I think it's helpful to think of this um, as a museum curator. So we can accept data through various defined channels, um, importantly validate those data for quality. We recognize that, um, that quality is key to making good use of these data, um, both for the purposes of the CTN and for research um, analyses, to catalog its features and then to securely store these data for long-term preservation and reuse. Then we can locate, retrieve, integrate, and present data from across the hub for a wide variety of activities from sites that participate and interested researchers. This is a schematic that shows you a little bit about the data acquisition process. The purpose of tonight, uh, tonight's presentation and Q&A is not to really get into a lot of the technical details for exactly how the data acquisition works. Um, though we would be happy to get into those details for those who are interested in sticking around afterwards to talk more. But in part, uh, the slide also illustrates the process, and we recognize that a lot of work goes into contract negotiation as sites uh, get, uh, get up and running um, for data transfer, um, and we recognize that this process can take several months. Um, but um, not, that notwithstanding, uh, we are strongly uh, encouraging and even requiring sites that want to be part of the CTN um, to participate in the data hub um, so that we can begin this process um, as quickly as possible. And so we'll have a lot more details on uh, onboarding, consent, um, and uh, contracts um, that will be available to those sites that we can uh, make available after tonight's presentation. So what are the benefits for sites in the clinical trials network uh, that are going to participate in the data hub? Um, we anticipate making site data available using specific dashboards um, that may be um, helpful for a variety of internal activities. Um, we will have the ability to compare site uh, data with aggregate data from across the data hub. Again, this is mostly at the level of um, descriptive data and cohort characterization with potentially more capabilities available down the road. Um, and then those sites that are participating, of course, can request data sets um, for research analyses um, and uh, scientific inquiry, and uh, we'll be happy to go through how that process works as well. So we do see that there will be several benefits for sites that choose to participate. And then uh, we have many, many ways to get in touch with us, um, myself and Rob Plavnik, Yuchen and Yechum, uh, Dave Vicola, and others from our um, technology vendor. I'm happy to take, uh, take questions and have further discussions after tonight's discussion. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, I just wanted to add my thanks to Chaz's, to the task force members and all the colleagues here and to the ASH staff for the a tremendous amount of uh, work and collaboration that's brought us to this, to this point. Uh, you know, I went to my first ASH meeting in 1972 as a third-year medical student. Um, the entire meeting fit into a room about this size. Um, there was one session on red cell hematology, and there was, I, th I believe in that session, maybe two papers on sickle cell disease. When I looked at this meeting, setting aside the 28,000 members and the, the line at the pretzel stands, uh, uh, I was counting up the number of sessions in which uh, either sickle cell uh, diseases uh, were the topic or figured prominently in the program. And the, that number of sessions, I think it's safe to say, exceeded the total number of sessions for that ASH meeting. In, in 1972, so it's really gratifying to see that kind of um, effort uh, and attention. You know, starting in the molecular genetics of that field in 1972, um, those of us coming into hematology had the privilege of witnessing how the ability to apply molecular genetics to hemoglobin diseases, which was the only way it could be applied to human medicine in those days, brought people in who have gone on to fertilize all of the other fields of medicine. So all of the precision medicine and all of the people who are benefiting uh, from the application of molecular genetics to medicine really owe uh, those patients with sickle cell disease and thalassemia 
the, uh, the progress that made uh, their better outcomes possible. So that's my long way of adding to Chuck's uh, uh, best one-liner, which is it's about time. Uh, this is uh, uh, payback for something we owe uh, all of those patients and their descendants. So I'm here in two roles. One is as the co-chair of the Clinical Trials Network, which uh, you heard about from Chuck, and the other um, is as the executive director of a related and collaborating uh, initiative um, started by the uh, NIH called the uh, Cure Sickle Cell uh, Initiative. Um, this began in September of this year after about nine or ten months of background planning and organizational work. Um, it really uh, came from uh, a uh, desire by Francis Collins, the NIH director, and Gary Gibbons, the uh, director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, um, to look at um, ways to accelerate the application of very specific set of technologies and science, uh, and that is uh, the progress that you've seen at this meeting being made in gene therapy um, and in gene uh, editing, uh, which of course, um, if able to be applied, would be the definitive therapy for sickle cell disease since it's such a well-characterized um, and very, uh, uh, very focused um, genetic uh, uh, lesion um, in the beta globin gene. So um, that is the domain of uh, activity that, uh, that this Cure Sickle Cell Initiative is focused on. It could be gene transfer therapies. It could be gene editing of things like CRISPR-Cas9 or related technology. It could potentially be small molecules. Uh, it could be attempts to replace the abnormal gene with the normal one. It could be uh, attempts to uh, promote uh, fetal hemoglobin synthesis um, at high enough levels uh, to mitigate um, the phenotype, the uh, clinical phenotype of the disease. So that's the, that is what cure sickle cell disease is really focused on. And in that sense, it's a highly complementary yet overlapping um, effort um, to uh, the initiative uh, that we've heard about with the clinical trials network and um, the data uh, the data hub. So our vision is to accelerate the development of treatments uh, based at genetic-based cures uh, for the sickle cell syndromes um, and to be able to leverage resources um, that, again, in some ways are overlapping but also in some ways an opportunity to be um, complementary uh, to the efforts that you're hearing about from our, uh, our ASH uh, activities. Uh, and specifically, the uh, Cure Sickle Cell Initiative uh, takes advantage of a um, particular kind of mechanism, budgetary mechanism, that the federal government allows to a relatively small number of federal agencies called the Other Transaction Authority, or OTA. Some of you may remember DARPA uh, at the beginnings of the Internet, which was actually funded by this mechanism uh, attached to the Department of Defense, but allowed to deploy funds, convening power, in ways that um, were more flexible uh, than the usual ways that one does grants and contracts um, with the uh, cabinet-level departments in the federal government. So we are funded by the OTA, and uh, we work through a corporation called EMIS. Some of you may be familiar with them, with the Bone Marrow Transplant Network, which um, is funded by uh, the same kind of mechanism. And using the flexibility of that, we hope to supplement the traditional investigator-initiated applications that are focused on sickle cell disease, which will in no way be negatively impacted by this initiative. In fact, we hope will be positively impacted. So um, for discovery science, for early translation, uh, for any of the things that are in the NIH portfolio now, those mechanisms will continue and hopefully will be enhanced. We are focused on using the OTA to help investigators, whether it be companies, uh, principal uh, academic investigators, um, uh, whether it be um, efforts in patient engagement that, for example, we do in collaboration with ASH, to be able to put funds to overcome those 
barricades and blocks that would slow progress in the completion of clinical trials, in the deployment of clinical trials ultimately um, in, uh, to practice. Um, so that, uh, that really is why this CURE uh, sickle cell initiative uh, was uh, created. Um, we've got the website uh, link up there um, and uh, the URL. Uh, uh, keep the slide on for a second if you want to write it down, but it um, is easily found on your search engine. Um, and all you need to do if you have an interest and think you have um, an idea that would help us move these trials uh, along, um, then uh, just drop us a line there. We have put together uh, a pretty uh, simple and we hope a agile process to review and evaluate these grants and take them back to the NIH. Uh, for uh, funding uh, approval. Some examples of things that people have asked us about already um, are biomarkers, um, are assays for endpoints. Uh, not all endpoints that are going to allow progress are going to necessarily be clinical endpoints, given the complexity of the sickle cell syndromes. Another thing that uh, we've done already uh, has been to establish uh, partnerships um, to work jointly uh, in areas where we are complementary, uh, particularly with the uh, American Society uh, of Hematology. We've entered into a, a memorandum of understanding um, uh, with ASH uh, and with the uh, Stem Cell Agency uh, in California, and in particular with ASH, we've already started joint efforts in the patient engagement area, which you heard about just a few minutes ago. Uh, we're hoping to um, arrive at a way to uh, collaborate effectively in the, uh, uh, the data gathering efforts, the data hub, uh, and we anticipate there'll be a number of other areas in which we'll be working together. We certainly anticipate that those sites in the clinical trial network uh, would be great places um, to be able to do clinical trials uh, of um, gene therapy and gene editing um, in a much more effective and efficient uh, way. So these are our priority activities that we've done so far. We've had think tanks, uh, we've had round tables, um, we have conducted some focus groups nationwide um, and comparing notes with the efforts that ASH has done. As we pull these together, we found very, very similar um, concerns and priorities of uh, patients and providers out there. Uh, we have patient uh, representatives on the executive and governance committees and uh, indeed are populating them now on all of our uh, subcommittees, the, the ones that are uh, listed here. So this in one sense is a subset of the broad area of clinical research that ASH will support through the Clinical Trials Network. We're focused on the so-called definitive curative therapies. And on the other sense, because of our ability to use this OTA uh, to interact uh, across federal agencies, um, to fund um, at a fairly large scale, if necessary, uh, some of these efforts to get the clinical trials finished, um, that we are um, a, a superset uh, of this uh, activity. So we're looking forward very much to working together with ASH and CIRM and additional partners, uh, FDA and so forth, uh, as we go forward. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I think uh, we're ready to take questions.